It's that time again, folks, the time where we take a topic, we go online, and then we take every argument that the left makes word for word that we can find, we refute it, and then we still have leftists in the comments claiming that I straw manned all of the arguments. That is right, ladies and gentlemen. And this time, we're talking about immigration and open borders. So please, for the sake of the country, do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off, Kami. You know why we're here. You stayed tuned. I appreciate that. I'd also appreciate it if you followed me on Twitter before we get started. Um, there's going to be, by the way, timestamps of each argument in the description if you want to hear a specific one. But other than that, we'll just dive right in. But I actually, I want to start um, first by showing you a video that Alyssa Milano posted on Twitter the other day, just to give you a general idea of what you're going to encounter when you talk about this issue of what uh, separation is doing to families. And I watched the video, and I'm gonna post the video in this thread after I'm done. So please, please watch the video with the sound up. What the f are we doing? We are destroying children's lives because arbitrary lines in the sand we can't let this be the new normal this is not what this besides what this country is founded on this is not innately who we are as human beings i mean she's literally crying how can you take that seriously how is anyone expected to take that seriously <laughs> Please allow yourself to feel. This is so sad. This isn't who we are. We're separating families. Like, yeah, what do you think happens in this country when you commit a crime, you idiot? You go, you get a DUI with your kid in the car. You're just going to be like, officer, you got to let him in the cell with me because we can't be separated. I mean, she's literally stumbling over her words here. And this is what happens, by the way. So you've got Trump in office now and the media goes, yeah, I don't really like that. So we're going to bring up something that was going on long before Trump. And then we're going to direct national attention towards that. And then that's going to demonize Trump. Okay, one, two, three, break. And so then you've got these celebrities who have become used to having people take pictures of them all the time and oh can you, can you please sign this for me oh can i get you anything is the temperature okay in here and it's inevitably built up this artificial sense of importance within these people to where now they come out and they're like i have interesting things to say what i say is important and the media's like oh yeah look at her no she's crying trump oh trump look what you did you made Alyssa milano cry boo trump and it's like who the hell cares if you can't talk about politics without crying you shouldn't be talking about politics like simple as that Go back to entertaining people. Let the big brains discuss politics if you can't contain yourself. And, oh, well, we're not just talking about politics. We're talking about human rights. Oh, you did it again. You did it again. Get a hold of your brainwashed Hollywood brain, you idiot. You're just a pawn. You're a cog in the wheel of the anti-Trump narrative. You think you're special? The day you stop bitching about Donald Trump is the day your media coverage drops to zero. And you know that, but you don't care because you're addicted to external gratification and you're a sellout that lacks integrity. And this is what you'll find um, is occupying the vast majority of this, you know, the rhetoric of this discussion, this incoherence and emotional rhetoric. It's actually even worse, I think, than the abortion discussion, which is almost impressive in its own way. But anyways, let's start going through these. Um, We'll start with everyone's favorite. America is a nation of immigrants. Yeah, not really. To be honest, America was not founded by immigrants. America was founded by settlers. The difference between the two being that immigrants leave their home country and travel to an already established country to reside in. Settlers leave their home country and then establish the country in which they will reside. Without the settlers, America would still be an unnamed continent inhabited by nomadic tribes. And after the country was established, it was still far from being a diverse country because, you know, oh, diversity is a strength and it always has been, right? So according to the late Harvard professor Samuel Huntington, even as late as 1990, decades after the demographically impactful Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965, 50% of the American population could be traced back to the white and black Americans in 1790. Nearly all of the white population in America from 1600 to 1790 came from a geographic area of the world that's about twice the size of Texas, and the vast majority of U.S. presidents were exclusively of British or Dutch descent, similar to the founding fathers and original settlers. The presidents that have had different ethnicities would be the Roosevelts, who were also French in addition to British and Dutch. Hoover, who was Swiss and German in addition to British and Dutch. Nixon, who was German in addition to Dutch. And a few others composed of other European countries. And then, of course, Barack Obama, who was part Kenyan. The entire black population came from an area of West Africa that's about, I think, the size of Florida. Yeah. And um, until the Immigration Act in 1965, America was never less than 99% white, Western European, and West African black. That's not diverse. That's biracial. America is America because of these WASPs. They're called, which stands for White Anglo-Saxon Protestants. If America hadn't been composed of WASPs, 
wasps and had been composed of more French or Spanish or Portuguese Catholics, then it wouldn't be America. It'd be Quebec or Mexico or Brazil, as Huntington writes. And it's important to note that an immigrant is defined as a person who comes to permanently live in a foreign country. And we'll use this to segue into Ellis Island because they often like to bring that up and then, you know, repeat the, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. And then they show the pictures of the immigrants at the border, uh, the southern border that were taken in like 2014. And then they use that to try and combat the Trump administration somehow. But they like to romanticize Ellis Island as the landmark of immigration because they'll say, oh, well, most people that arrived at Ellis Island were processed in a few hours and there were no immigration laws. And that's just so false. And I know it's false because I've actually been to Ellis Island. I've read the placards, and I remember just being astonished at how wrong the left is about immigration at Ellis Island. Firstly, the entire time that Ellis Island was processing immigrants from 1892 until 1954, they only received about 12 million people. 12 million in 62 years. That is nothing. That is peanuts compared to now. And sure, it's an important landmark for immigration, but it's also an important landmark for deportation. They systematically evaluated potential immigrants to determine whether or not they would become a burden to the country. And if they determined that you would become a burden to the country, you were deported. And that's just if you made it to Ellis Island before you even boarded the ship to get there per the 1893 U.S. immigration law, you'd have to answer up to 31 questions which would be recorded on the manifest list regarding your name, age, gender, marital status, occupation, nationality, ability to read or write, race, physical and mental health, last residence, and the name and address of the nearest relative or friend in the immigrant's country or origin. And they were asked whether they had at least $25, whether they'd ever been in prison, an almshouse, or an institution, or my personal favorite, if they were polygamists or anarchists. And then you'd get to Ellis Island and they'd verify that information. And then people that were, quote, liable to become public charges had to go to a room called the hearing room and they would have to convince the board that they were not going to be a burden to the country. They were given a card with the initials SILPC, which stood for special inquiry likely to become a public charge. They would then have to convince a board of special inquiry of his or her ability to earn a living and stay off the public dole. And by 1917, admission laws prohibited the admission of aliens diagnosed as suffering from any mental impairment. Doctors based their decisions on their subject's level of acquired knowledge, problem-solving ability, behavior, and attitude. Forgetting even that, it's apples and oranges, my friends, because they're not the same type of immigrant. Their motivations are different. We talked about how the definition of an immigrant is someone who permanently stays in the country to which they've immigrated. And that wasn't the case back in the day. One third of pre-1965 immigrants went home. Why did they come here? They wanted to work and earn money, and then they often took that money back home to their families. They weren't coming here to exploit the country. They couldn't. We didn't have a welfare state for them to exploit. They had to be independent and productive by necessity because otherwise they would starve. Not exactly the case now as 63% of illegal immigrant households are on welfare programs. These immigrants don't respect this country. If they did, they would go through the process legally, but they don't. Ellis Island was a legal process, illegally crossing the border and demanding handouts? Not so much. We're not a nation of immigrants. We're a nation of hardworking settlers that were required, not just expected, but required to be independent, functioning members of society. Immigration was inherently a process of merit-based evaluation by necessity. Now we've got more than 70% of just our legal immigrants coming on family ties with chain migration. About half of those households are on welfare. So yeah, early immigration to this country was very different from what we're seeing now. Yes, they were coming here for a better life, but they also recognized that the creation of that better life was entirely their responsibility. So anyways, next one, um, and it's kind of related. So Americans live on stolen land. You don't get to say who gets to live there because you stole the land, etc. Okay, so first let's acknowledge that the left pretends that America is the only country that has immigration laws or is the only country that acquired its land by stealing. Um, we didn't steal the land. Stealing implies that there was a solidified entity from which we stole the land, which is not the case. You can't steal something that doesn't have an owner. We successfully conquered some of the land from the Native Americans, other parts of it we purchased, but the Native Americans were also at war with each other over land, so I'm perplexed by the idea that we stole it from somebody. Stole it from who? To which tribe are you referring? And also, should we have returned it to them and let them keep fighting over it? Would that have been better as long as it's not the evil Americans doing the fighting? I'll let you in on a little history here. I want you to have this, this pearl of wisdom, which is that you can trace back the land of pretty much every country on the face of the earth to a group of people to which that land no longer belongs. I know it's kind of a bummer, but it happens. And I'm not quite sure why you only want America to apologize for it. I don't think it's because you find land acquisition unethical. I think it's actually because you just hate America. I haven't seen you lecture the British, the French, the Turks, Japanese, just us. And also the idea that we don't get to decide immigration policy because we supposedly stole the land is foolish. Who decides it then? No one? Do we, do we just not have any? I know that's what you'd prefer, but 
still it's silly and you know now you've got people even saying make america mexico again because they still haven't gotten over the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo and you know all we ask is that you apply the logic consistently so i'll make america mexico again how about you make mexico the aztec empire again you savages that was mean what you did to them next one america is a melting pot we have no culture etc um this is, of course, not true. Just because anyone can come to America and become an American doesn't mean that becoming an American has no meaning other than residency. And we tend not to understand this because we're so used to American culture, but America is not the natural state of the world. America is not normal. It's exceptional, hence the term American exceptionalism. The United States isn't just an idea. The microwave oven is an idea. The internal combustion engine is an idea. The United States cannot be emulated anywhere else in the world. The only countries that come close are other Western countries with a similar but not identical value framework. And that's because we have a superior culture that values Protestant morals, individualism, and the rule of law. Had it not been for those elements in our culture, we wouldn't be America. And the left has this sophomoric failure to recognize that because they believe in cultural relativism. They believe that it's offensive and untrue to pretend that some cultures are superior to other cultures. And that's a nice idea. It is. It makes me feel fuzzy. But people are risking their lives every day to flee their cultures in order to enter into our culture. If America didn't have a culture, there'd be no reason to come here. Why move to a place with no defined culture if you can just stay in the place that has your culture? If there's no culture and you come bring your culture, what's the point? You're just making it like where you came from. What's in it for you? You want, the, you want the Great Lakes or something? Because you can't have them. You can't. And also, if we allow for other cultures to pour into our culture, our culture goes away. And so, no, America's culture isn't that we allow for other cultures to come and be in America. No, we allow that, but provided that they assimilate to American culture, because we know that American culture is superior, and we don't want to not be America. We don't want to be Syria. We don't want to be Mexico. We want to be America. And the left might not understand that. The left might not understand what actually makes America so spectacular and different from every other country on the face of the planet. But you know who does understand that? everybody trying to get into our country. For them, being an American isn't a right, it's a privilege. Some of us are blessed by being born into this country. Um, and so we have the right to be an American, others are not so lucky, and so they have to go through the legal process in hopes that they are granted the privilege of becoming an American. To do otherwise is disrespectful and undermines the value of what it means to truly be an American, and also demonstrates a sense of gross entitlement. So, next one, and I'm trying to do this in an order that flows as nicely as possible, so. Um, immigration is a human right. We have freedom of movement. Borders don't exist, etc. So the larger market of this idea is occupied by people that regard anything that they want as a human right, be it healthcare, housing, tampons, whatever. Those people are actually mentally stunted. But ignoring the incoherent screeching, there's actually a case to be made at the idea that borders aren't real and that immigration is a human right. I disagree with it, but it does actually exist amongst relatively respectable people that aren't just screaming about things and labeling them as human rights. So basically the argument is that if I see a tree, I know that it is a tree, but if I see a large concentration of trees, I might call those a forest. But it doesn't mean anything other than there are many individual trees. And so my concept of a forest is nothing more than a concept of something that already physically exists independently of my concept. And so a forest is an aggregation, but it's an abstract notion and therefore doesn't exist. And so then they use this to say that countries don't exist and that the concept of a country is just an arbitrary construct. And so then they'll bring up freedom of association and basically make the case that since people should be free to associate with whomever they choose, they should be free to engage in said association wherever they choose, which would mean in any country that they choose. And they note that the state did not create freedom of association. Freedom of association predates the existence of the state and therefore predates the existence of the arbitrary boundaries imposed by the state. But the problem with this argument, ignoring the subjective debate about what is and what is not a human right, is that it ignores the importance of location. If you and I are exercising our right to freely associate with each other in a restaurant, but that restaurant is now closed, it wouldn't be an infringement upon our rights to freely associate with each other to tell us to leave. And if we didn't leave, then the police would be called to enforce the rights of the property owner that we were infringing upon. And if people want to view borders as arbitrary, whether they be national, municipal, whatever, why are those borders arbitrary but the borders of your house or business? Why are those not arbitrary? Governments have gone to war and entered into contracts to protect their borders. Is that invalid now? What ends up happening is by giving precedence to this right to immigration, you're undermining the rights of property owners to maintain possession and control of their property. And now with access to technology, you can contact someone almost anywhere in the world in a matter of seconds. So there's your freedom of association. You don't have a right to be in the this country unless you were born here or went through the process legally. Same for other countries. Try waltzing across the Canadian border while claiming it's your human right. It's not going to go well for you. And when, you know, 
all this talk about what is and what is not a right goes away. It ultimately comes down to what you can enforce. That's why we have the social contract here in America. I agree to certain conditions and in exchange the government is supposed to protect my rights with force if necessary. I have a right to self-preservation. I can enforce that with force if I have to. So you can claim that you have a right to enter the United States, but who's going to enforce that? You? Your migrant pals? Not likely. And this kind of leads into the next one, which is that... Um, People have a right to asylum. Asylum is a human right, etc. So with asylum, there's a big part of it that the left omits when they talk about it, which is that the law states that in order to be granted asylum, a person has to establish that he or she fears persecution from the government of their home country. Then the person has to prove that he or she would face persecution on account of one of five grounds, those being race, religion, nationality, political affiliation, or membership of a particular social group. In other words, it's total BS. We're being told that these people have a right to asylum, and the implication is that anyone from anywhere in the world who doesn't have it hunky-dory can come seek asylum because it's their right. And it's it's BS and we know that it's BS because these people are traveling through other countries to get to our country. So if their claims were legitimate, that they were being persecuted by the government of their home country, then theoretically they would be fine in any other country because it's a different government and therefore they would be safe from persecution. But that's not what we're seeing. We're actually seeing them demand entry into our country while waving the flag of the country that they claim they're fleeing because of persecution from that country's government. So yeah, it's incredible. So yes, you have a right to legitimate asylum in this country, but let's not pretend that this asylum, the, the ones that we're seeing at the border, let's not pretend that these claims are legitimate because they're very far from that. And when their claims are denied, which most of them are, they'll appeal it and then they clog up the courts with it, but hey, it's fine. We'll release you into the country. Just be sure to make it back for your court date. Oh, what's that? They didn't come back and now they're just in the country. Yeah, fantastic job. You guys really professional, very well handled, but while we're on that, let's talk about concentration camps. So they'll say, we've got concentration camps at the southern border, and we're subjecting these people to inhumane conditions. ICE is evil. They're harming people. All this general rhetoric that we've heard. Um, firstly, no, they're not concentration camps, and I'll explain why. But first, just note that the reason that they refer to them as concentration camps is because they want to draw the connection between Trump and Hitler. It's widely acknowledged that typically when we use the term concentration camp, we are referring to the Nazi camps that were set up in Germany and occupied Europe. And to use the same term to describe what we have at our southern border while hiding behind the blanket of, well, it's a camp of concentrated people. So it's a concentration camp. It's like, that's not how that works. In order for it to be a concentration camp, the people being concentrated have to be political prisoners or members of a persecuted minority, and they have to be being held there against their will. That's pretty fundamental. The people being detained at these facilities can leave anytime they please and go back to where they came. That was not the case for the people in actual concentration camps, you historically illiterate fools. They aren't political prisoners because they aren't political, and they aren't prisoners. They can leave at will, and they aren't a persecuted minority because persecuted minorities don't get to opt out of persecution as they do uh, if they choose to leave. Persecuted minorities also don't get to choose their status as a minority as illegal immigrants do by choosing to become immigrants and then doing so either legally or illegally. And as far as the facilities, the reason that the conditions are so bad is because there's too many people there. It's overcrowded. That's why they don't have enough resources. That's why there's scarcity. That's why people are crammed together. They don't have enough resources to make conditions better. And you've got a party that's proposing that instead of providing better funding, better border security, more judges to process cases, let's just abolish ICE. Let's just decriminalize border crossing. Let's just open up the borders. It's actually an alarming amount of stupidity that's being demonstrated. And as far as it being inhumane, I'd agree with you if they didn't have a choice. But again, they're welcome to leave. They're choosing not to because they want to get into our country. And at this time, this is the best that we can do for these people because we're certainly not just gonna open the borders. And that's really what the Democrats want from, from all of this. They've directed national attention to the border, but not because thousands of people are coming in every day, but because thousands of people are coming in every day with nowhere to go and it's sad. And they're hoping that finally Republicans just crack and say, okay, fine, forget additional funding, let's just cut a deal. Democrats don't care about what's happening at the border. It's just good optics for them so that they can go point the finger and then get what they really want. And with the whole, oh, well, they're being told to drink toilet water, who told you that? That was a claim supposedly made by a woman in the facility, so then supposedly told that to a Democrat congressman who was touring the facility and you believed it? Oh, politicians lie to gain support for their agenda. Hey, I wonder if that story is fake. Shut up, racist! And it's like, 
Yeah, I don't buy it. If it were that bad, they could leave, go apply for asylum elsewhere, go apply to come in legally to the United States. Other options do exist. No one's corroborated that story, and the Democrats will continue to shed their crocodile tears and also refuse to work with Republicans to solve this crisis that they supposedly care so much about. It's totally insincere. They're just trying to manipulate people into capitulating to their agenda. So next one uh, is we have a moral obligation to let them into our country. No, no, we don't, actually. We don't have, it's not immoral to enforce our laws and enforce our borders. There's quite literally billions Millions of people that don't have it as well as the average American. Are we morally obligated to let them in? Where do we draw the line? Isn't it all arbitrary? At what point do we say, okay, stop, we fulfilled our moral obligation, now we can close our borders. If we have a moral obligation to help anybody that is worse off than we are, do you understand how monumental of a task that you've just assigned to us? And even ignoring that, you're still wrong because a moral obligation isn't an obligation that stems from charity or benevolence. A moral obligation is an obligation that stems from justice and equity. That's why we had a moral obligation to fight the Nazis, but not to allow everyone into our country that would like to come in. Enforcing our laws and maintaining our borders is not fundamentally unjust, nor is it inequitable. To say that a moral obligation is an obligation rooted in charity would mean that you're morally obligated to pay for my lunch if I don't have money, which actually is basically what they believe. So I'm kind of wasting my time here, but rational people, you get the point. So uh, another one that stems from this is, oh, but we're all humans. No human is illegal. And it's like, yeah, you can say that. Secrete a little dopamine, feel virtuous, assure yourself that you're a good person, but you don't actually believe that. If you did, you'd welcome everybody into your home because after all, no human is illegal and property rights don't exist, I guess. But we're all humans. It's like, what does that even mean? When's the last time you volunteered your time to help anybody? People in this country specifically. I'm, I'm like, I'm truly asking because it's it seems that the only time your humanitarianism gets activated is when everyone is on social media complaining about something because the media told them to. So when it's illegal immigrants, oh, you're ready to link arms and protest, which is effectively just you complaining on social media or holding a sign outside of a building. So again, you can take a picture of yourself and then complain on social media, but you won't actually volunteer your time to a church or to a charity. So you have no ground to stand on. Next one, Americans approve of immigration. Therefore, immigration should keep happening. It's important to distinguish between legal and illegal immigration. It's true that most Americans approve of legal immigration, but that's very different than approving of illegal immigration. And then the reason that they lump everything into the discussion of just immigration without distinguishing between legal and illegal immigration is because it's easier to manipulate the conversation when you're framing everything as if it's about immigration, because now they can say, oh, Republicans don't want immigration. They're against immigrants. And then now Republicans will, oh, but no, no, not me. No, I like it. And then so you just instantly start playing defense. And so the the other reason that they do it too is because that's their end goal, by the way. They, they don't want a difference between illegal and legal immigration because they just want all immigration to be legal and unlimited. But you've actually got a record number of Americans saying that immigration is the most important problem. The vast majority want increased security at the border. A majority say that they worry about illegal immigration. I mean, I'm still kind of sick, excuse me. Uh, it's obvious that there's a distinct difference between legal and illegal immigration. And since most Americans are very against illegal immigration, the government that works for the American people should act in accordance with that. So next one, being anti-immigrant is racist. No, it is not. Immigrant isn't a race, therefore it can't be racist. Also, it's illegal immigrants we're talking about. And this is a true story. One time I was walking out of my high school, it was after school and I was wearing my Trump shirt. This was back in the days of the 2016 cycle. And this guy calls me over, he's like, hey man, let me talk to you for a second. So I was like, cool. So I go over there, he asked me why I support Trump. And so he and I are just having this discussion. And he told me that it is racist to be against illegal immigration. And I said the same thing. I said, well, no, it's impossible because illegal immigrants aren't a race. And I kid you not, this guy looks me in the eye and says, yeah, because illegal immigrants are all Mexican. And I didn't, even, I didn't even know what to do. I was like taken back by this. I was like, just how unaware he was of his own prejudice. It was actually amusing to me at the time. But other than that, he was cool. He was just trying to have a discussion. He wasn't trying to demonize me, which I respected. But so uh, next one, we need more immigrants because our population is aging. This one always kind of makes me chuckle because it's like, are the people who come here also not going to age? Like it's just us that age or is it that the people that are coming to replace us are all young people? And what I think they really mean by this is that our fertility rate is low enough to where we won't be able to replace ourselves. And the thing about that, firstly, is that our fertility rate is still one of the highest in the industrialized world. Could it and should it be higher? Yes. Should we incentivize people to have kids? Yes. And it's like, You've got the leftist media complex and they churn out this propaganda like marriage is oppressive. You'd be happier without kids. Don't settle down. Hookups are empowering. And then on the other hand, they're like, hmm, why aren't we having more kids? I guess we need to import people. And no, that's not the solution because it assumes that the population of our country stagnating or slightly shrinking is inherently bad. I disagree because it's more important to preserve the cultural integrity of our country than to preserve its population numerically. So moving on, illegal immigrants, 
uh, do the jobs that Americans won't do. This again is not true. And it's probably entirely rooted in stereotype, to be honest. And bear in mind that by definition, if an illegal immigrant is doing a job in this country, that is a job that an American could be doing and probably would be doing too. Because get this, data from the Department of Commerce shows that of the 474 separate and recognized civilian occupations in this country, only six occupations are a majority immigrant, both legal and illegal. These occupations are about 1% of the total U.S. workforce and native-born Americans still comprise 46% of workers in these occupations. Also, there are virtually zero occupations in which a majority of workers are illegal immigrants, doesn't exist, there is no job an American won't do. This argument is completely false. Next one. The wall won't work. They just use a ladder. It's a symbol of division. The wall is racist, etc. I actually don't understand the arguments against the wall, to be honest with you, because obviously the reasoning behind them is that people don't like anything that Trump does because orange man bad. But the most common rationalization of that would be that it's going to be ineffective and a waste of money, which again means squat coming from a party that wants to give health care to illegal immigrants, pay for college tuition, cancel student loan debt, all of their other fun ideas. But as far as being against the wall because it's a symbol of division or whatever, those people literally want open borders. They don't understand the importance of having a secure border. And again, they only want to apply their logic to America, despite the two thirds of the world's people live in countries that protect their borders with fences, walls, whichever barrier classification that you prefer. And studies have shown that if the wall on our southern border stopped only nine to 12 percent of illegal immigrants entering this country, which would be an almost impressive underperformance, comparatively speaking that the wall would pay for itself, considering the incredible costs that illegal immigrants impose on our country. And that's comparatively speaking to East Germany that experienced over a 90% drop in defections, Israel that experienced a 99.4% decrease in illegal crossings, or Hungary that went from thousands of illegal crossings every day to almost zero. You've got areas in Texas and Arizona that saw crossings drop over 90% once they erected a barrier. Walls work. Barriers work, and this idea that people would just bring ladders, that's actually something that only a person lacking cognitive functionality superior to a grape would say. Do you understand what a substantial obstacle a barrier is? Compare what we have now, which is only 29% of our border having a legitimate barrier, and the rest just having a small fence that's easy to hop over, to our border having a legitimate barrier. It's not the same, it's not even the same league, because now instead of people pouring through areas with no barrier, you've got significantly less people perhaps scaling the barrier, which is irrelevant, because now you've got a barrier that allows for our border patrol agents to spend less time patrolling these open areas and more time focusing on locatable breaches instead of playing cat and mouse in an open field. We've got 3,000 of these guys pouring in every day at our southern border. Do you actually think that if we had a barrier, all 3,000 would just climb it and our border patrol would just be sitting there impotently watching like, dude, come on, stop. It's like, no, you idiots. And also, you know, oh, what well, most people come in the country illegally, they overstay their visas and the numbers aren't exactly precise, but okay, so roughly 62% of the people that come here illegally every year overstay their visas, congrats. You've just made a case for the wall because it could impede at least 38% of illegal immigrants. That's quite significant. Also, you fail to recognize the difference between going through the visa waiver program where you have to be a citizen or national from only certain countries. You have to enter the country through a port of entry, which is usually at an airport. Does that mean nothing to you? The difference between, at the very least, we know who someone is, we know that they probably didn't bring anything terrible into the country because they had to go through a port of entry, and then compare that to just, like, oh, just an open field. Whoever wants to come in, bring whatever they want, bring whoever they want. You know, no one has any idea. Those are equal to you. And speaking of the type of people that are coming into this country, I've heard this one before, which is that, oh, immigrants aren't a terrorist threat. Firstly, no one is making the statement that immigrants are a terrorist threat. That being said, unrestricted illegal immigration is a terrorist threat. And we know this from reports that we've obtained from terrorists plotting to enter the country at our southern border. We know this from terrorists that we've caught at the border, terrorists that we've identified within migrant caravans heading to the border. So the threat is very real. And because the threat is very real, we have to take precautions because our duty is supposed to be to our people, the American people. And because the well-being of the American people is put at risk by allowing non-Americans to enter without restriction, we can't allow it to happen. We have no obligation to let them in already. The only obligation that we have it to preserve the safety of the American people. And if that safety is put at risk and the, the name of some superficial humanitarian policy from the left, which is really just a means to obtain power, we need to seriously evaluate our priorities. The people that say things like, oh, we should criminalize desperation, that's that's one, that's a fun one. That is such an ignorant statement. We shouldn't criminalize desperation. That literally means 
that anyone who commits a criminal act while desperate ought to be exempt from consequences. A man who is hungry shouldn't be prosecuted for mugging you. Are you sure you want to establish that precedent? You're kind of destroying the country just a little bit. Some people are desperate to preserve the country. I don't think that situation works out well in your favor. And here's the thing, you know, you can be, as an individual, you can be empathetic. You can do that. You can wire money to these people. You can send food to them. You can do all of that, but you don't. How many of these people are actually sponsoring a family in poverty? They aren't. But what they are doing is trying to force the government, which means you, to be empathetic on their behalf. That's really the core of the whole ideology. The idea that forced charity is somehow moral. I can force you to provide charity to someone, and that is moral, and I am good for doing so. The government of the United States of America was designed for the people of the United States of America. That means that the only people the United States government has an obligation to serve are the people of America. It's that simple. And speaking of the people, let's talk about amnesty. They want amnesty. They want a pathway to citizenship. They say that, oh, we can't deport them because it's mean. There's too many of them to deport. There's too many of them to do anything else except a pathway to, no, no, no. So you have to understand that illegal immigration is a very ugly problem that's been getting larger and larger with very little being done about it. And because of that, the solution to the problem is going to be ugly. With deportations, oh, it's so sad that a person's getting deported. No, what's sad is that you expect us to selectively enforce our laws. That's really what's sad, that you would continue to incentivize further illegal immigration and then propose solutions to problems that you've created that only continue to incentivize illegal immigration. I'm actually speaking in outdated terms right now since they've come out in support of decriminalizing border crossing in the first place, so pretty soon it won't even matter. The solution to the problem is to secure the southern border. That's step one. We still have yet to do that. But if and when we secure the southern border, then we focus on deporting the criminal illegal aliens. And yes, I'm aware that by definition, they're all criminals because they're here illegally. Right. But speaking pragmatically, we probably can't deport 20 to 30 million people. We can deport a lot more than the left pretends that we can, but I'm not so sure about 20 to 30 million people. I'm pretty sure that most people aren't even in support of total deportation. And that's the correct figure, by the way. It's not 11 million. It's easily over 20 million, probably closer to 30. But after we secure the border, and perhaps let these illegals continue to live in the shadows like they have been for the last 30 years. That's all fine, but under no circumstances can we give them amnesty. We cannot do it. I've said this before. This is what frustrates me about conservatives. They spend so much time like, grr, I hope the government doesn't raise my taxes. And it's like, buddy, the Democrats are going to try to give themselves 30 million new votes, and then your country is gone, and there's nothing really, you know, nothing matters anymore. You can't do anything about it. Historically speaking, the leadership of your party is incompetent, so it's probably going to happen unless you're actively fighting against it. We can repeal a tax increase. We can repeal gun control. We can never repeal amnesty. Once that happens, it's wraps. Pack it up. Go home. It's over. Like, you don't have to be ashamed of not wanting amnesty because it means that your party will never hold office again. The reason that they want amnesty in the first place is for precisely that reason. And actually, that brings us to the next thing that they say, which is that, well, you can't actually deport them because it would be too difficult. It would be too large of a task, a task to complete. And I think that there are some examples from history that would challenge this, namely Harry Truman, who deported 3.4 million, Dwight Eisenhower, who deported 2.1 million. Also, the fact that if we cut their welfare benefits, many of them would self-deport. It isn't impossible. And, you know, we often hear rhetoric from the left about gun control, like, oh, well, if it saves one life, it's worth it. We may not be able to prevent every senseless act of violence in this country. If there's even one thing that we can do to reduce it, if even one life can be saved, we've got an obligation to try. And the thing about that is we have a right to bear arms, so you can't take that away. But these illegal immigrants have no right to be in this country, and they do murder our people. So where's your, oh, if it could only save one life, it would be worth it. Where's your empathy now? We can't even enforce our current laws. Mass deportation would actually pay for itself when taking into account the massive burden that illegal immigrants impose upon our country. And we restore the integrity of our country in the process. And you really can't put a price tag on that now, can you? But they say that, oh, illegal immigrants actually help the economy. And this is also just not true. And I try not to insult people generally. I think I've probably done a bad job with that today. I just get frustrated with this topic. But I don't know, man. It's like the left, they complain about worker exploitation and how capitalism provides wealth for the employer at the expense of the employee. And it's like they actually fail to recognize that when you import people, particularly low skill people, at the same time the low skill market is shrinking in this country, you reduce the amount of money that they will be paid to do a job because they're competing with more people. It's very basic economics. So because of that, immigration redistributes wealth from those who compete with immigrants, the American worker, to those who use immigrants, employers. Some people perceive this to be a good thing 
We can have that discussion. It would have to be a lengthy discussion in order to do it justice. So for now, I think what matters is that the net fiscal burden of illegal immigrant households in the United States is about 54 and a half billion per year. They're consuming about 54 and a half billion more in taxes than they're contributing. And we've gone over that 63% are receiving welfare benefits. The average illegal immigrant has about a 10th grade education. 25% only have a high school degree. Half have less than a high school degree. These people are competing with Americans for jobs and depressing wages as a result. And now we're talking about giving them free health care too. When people say, hey, hey, will they help the economy because our gross domestic product increases? It's like, yeah, okay, let's go drop a $150,000 bomb on a tent in Afghanistan. That'll boost the GDP too. I'm not frankly convinced that depressing the wages of the American worker while compromising the integrity of the country is worth an increase in GDP that we're perfectly capable of achieving by ourselves because with all the tax money that we have to spend dealing with this issue, that could all be in the pockets of American people being used to stimulate the economy, create jobs, invest, whatever. But it isn't because it has to be used to tackle this crisis that our incompetent leaders have caused. Illegal immigrants commit less crime than native born citizens. Finding credible information about this is extremely difficult because our government doesn't actually collect data on it. And even if they did, the media wouldn't report it. Um, and the methodologies are always totally skewed. Like they'll exclude convicted criminals whose country of birth is unknown or left out. They'll classify Hispanics as whites. They'll exclude legal immigrants. So what we're left with for the most extensive information provided by our government is the bare minimum estimate of immigrants in American prisons or in jails. And the government doesn't automatically collect data on this. It had to be requested by Congress. And so in 2000, in 2011, the Government Accountability Office reported that America was incarcerating at least, absolute minimum, 351,000 criminal aliens. That's about 55,000 in federal prisons, about 291,000 in state and local facilities. And this figure is acknowledged to be an understatement in the report because they excluded convicted illegal aliens for whom the state did not submit reimbursement requests to the federal government. Prisoners whose country of birth could not be determined, children born to illegal aliens on U.S. soil, immigrants without at least one felony or two misdemeanor convictions, or illegal immigrants convicted after being amnestied by Reagan in 1986. So given our total prison population, that means at the very least they make up about 15% of our total prison population. The very least. And given the fact that by definition every illegal immigrant has committed a crime by being here illegally, I'm not sure I trust your metric there. You know, and the crime rate, oh, the crime rate. Even if we could thoroughly establish it, it's entirely irrelevant because we have no obligation to bring them here. We have no obligation to bear the risk at the expense of our citizens. Every murder that illegal aliens commit is a murder that would not have happened if they weren't on the soil of a country in which they have no right to be. I don't care if the murder rate is one in 100,000, 50,000 in 100,000. If it costs one American life, it's not worth it because they aren't American citizens. They have no right to be in our country. That's really what this is about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Are we going to put our people first, the people of America, or are we going to give precedence to non-Americans almost always at the expense of the American people? That's really an important question, and I think that our politicians are scared to answer it because they know that they work for us, and they know that most people would be quite upset to learn that they're selling us out to expand their power over us, so they're trying to just lull us into submission with talks about morality and obligation and concentration camps. All of it's nonsense. It's an evil agenda that seeks to lower the quality of life of you, your children, your neighbors, your family, so that a small minority of people can continue to exercise increasing amounts of power over us, the elites, because they don't actually care about you. They certainly don't care about illegal immigrants, but they figured out that, well, we could just use them to our advantage for now, and so here we are. And honestly, I know you're expecting like a, ah, oh, it'll be K, you know, the American spirit will prevail, but I'm really not too sure about that. I'm not, you know, I'm just going by history. That doesn't mean that we should give up. In fact, I'm really probably hurting morale right now. <laughs> just give me a second. Um. Now is not the time to embrace nihilism. The natural state of the American spirit is to not allow itself to die. So you tell me, has it died? Because if not, we can fix this. We can fix our country. We can preserve the spirit and greatness of America for future generations. You are not the problem. You are smart. You are cunning. You are aware. The problem is those around you who are falling for the leftist indoctrination. And so it is your job to educate them. It is your job to inform them of the severity of these problems. We are stronger in great numbers. And so it is your duty as an American to identify the threat that we are currently facing to other Americans so that we can all fight it together. That's a bit better for the team morale, right? It got a little, uh, got a little pessimistic before, before the helmet came on. So, uh, yeah, we're in hot water. <laughs> I'm gonna be totally honest. Oh man. Hey guys, if you like this video, you should subscribe and also like it, like give it a thumbs up. Like if you like it, that's cool, but like give it a thumbs up. Uh, also leave it a comment and then share it with your friends. That's my favorite, that's underrated. Most people don't do that. So shout out to everybody that shares these with your friends. 
Um, for those of you that don't have friends, I don't mean to discriminate, but uh, you could you could like print out a link and post it on poles around your city, like next to like lost dog things or whatever. Like, you know how they have the little things and then you tear off the phone number for like, oh, I need a babysitter. You tear off the, just do that. But with little like URL links or whatever, you know? So thank you so much for watching and may God bless America. I missed. There we go.